Let me take you first to 1956. So this is a workshop at the Dartmouth Summer School in Vermont, and it's considered the date of birth of artificial intelligence. And let me read the statement they made why they had this meeting. To proceed on the basis of a conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can be in principle be so precisely described that the machine can be made to simulate it. Think about it. They want to crack intelligence. They want to have a computer do what humans do. That's 1956. That's a bold goal, because computer in 1956 is like this. Hmm? So when you have this and you think about making a computer simulate intelligence, you really have a vision. Think about it. If you swipe on your iPhone, the computing power to do that simple action might take this machine months. Hmm? So a session on Facebook may take 15 years. Hmm? So it's a long shot to think of artificial intelligence in that environment. And in fact, it took something like 50 to 60 years before that promise could be materialized. So we are more or less in 2012, 2010, 2012, that the first wave of big important results came out. The first wave of important algorithms that sort of simulate the brain and do something like the brain do, does better. Image recognition is the first big example. Image recognition in implies that you have an image, a picture of something, and a machine tells you what's in there. Right? So this has been worked on for many, many years, and you can see the algorithms were OK for a long time. They could recognize three out of four images, which is not very good for doing things. This is just plain software. And then a group of researchers in Toronto say, forget about that way of doing things. We don't take an algorithm, a software, which you have put all the instruction to say how to recognize an image, but we teach the algorithm. We take an algorithm which is actually designed to learn, not to do things, but to learn. What happens is that from 75%, it goes up to 80%. And then year after year, it becomes superhuman. So it means it does a human task better than a human. And now you can do that in image recognition, in text recognition, in uh, speech, in motion, and so on, and so on, and so on. In the past, everything we did with software was instructions. You tell a software what to do. And everything you do with the software has to be told to the software by somebody. So when you click a key on a keyboard, somebody has told the machine to do everything that happens until something comes up on the screen, except for bugs, right? When you have bugs, that's the only time when a software invents something, even if it's something that you don't really want. So the new set of algorithms is, is, are based on a different premise. The premise that you copy the way the brain works. And the brain works in this way. Many simple pieces of computing, which are called neurons, which are compiled together in a very complex layer. And this is how it happens within this um, image recognition algorithm. So you put an image at the entrance. That image is segmented in different places. And after you've shown many, many images, that algorithm can uh, make the association between the input and the output. You show that image. And this is Sarah. You saw another image, and this is another person. Facebook does that all the time. So whenever you post something in Facebook, the first thing that happens if there is a picture there, it goes through a series of neural networks, which actually split out the content. <coughs> because of that, you have a change in the paradigm. You go from software or algorithms in the old way in which you actually do instructions. You tell the algorithm everything that you want it to do. Hmm? That's why you call instructions in software. You go from there to what we call supervised learning. So you show algorithms, many, many examples of images, of speech, of applications for university, and so on. And that algorithm recognizes the relationship between something that is this and the output. It makes the connection between input and output. And then you show it something it hasn't seen, and it can make it itself. It's a very, very simple way of doing intelligence. It's actually very, very simple. This is not how our brain works in practice. We do many other things. But this is what we have now. So it's not really artificial intelligence. It's what we call restricted artificial intelligence, which is extremely powerful, nonetheless. Where we are going to go, it's unsupervised learning. So you need very few examples to learn. Think about the first time you saw a segue. Right? You just needed one frame, one second of that object to figure out it was in the same category of skateboards, bicycles, and so on. You didn't need anything else, just one example. Computers cannot do that. And it might take years or decades for them to learn it, or maybe never. But in any case, so this is the path where we are. So at this moment, we know how to do supervised learning. We know how to teach machines from many examples to do it better than humans. And that's powerful. 
It's powerful because if a person can do a task, a mental task, in less than a second, probably it can be automated. Probably there's an algorithm that does it better than you. But not in 10 years, not in five years, with what we have now. Technology is the sixth now. If you take that a step further, what is the impact? Why is it important? Why is it important? Because about 60% of jobs, occupations, and so on will be changed by that. Without any development, anything new, just what we have now. So all my job, your future jobs, and so on, will be affected by this in a substantial, fundamental way. So in five years from now, it will be impossible to imagine a doctor that does a diagnosis without consulting an algorithm. That's just impossible to imagine. It's just impossible to conceive a lawyer that starts a case without an agent doing the background work for the lawyer itself. So it's important. So the question is, can we trust these algorithms? Do they tell you the truth? And when they make decisions for you, do they have a moral standard that they use for making the decision? So I'm going to touch on some of these elements in the presentation now. The first problem you have is this. Many of the powerful tools that we have developed within what we call artificial intelligence are actually black boxes. So you know that they work well. You know what you put in, you know what you put out. You don't really know why they work that well. It is surprising, but we actually don't know. The real function, the real inner working of a neural network, we know the wiring, but why does it do what it does? We actually don't know. So you have to start thinking about how do you actually poke inside this algorithm to make sure that they do what you want, hmm? and they do it in a, in a correct way. So let's start with a simple case. In this case, let's say that you want to interpret this image, and you want to have an algorithm to figure out where there's more people. That's a simple case, right? There will be no algorithm in the world that make a different assumption. This is Obama inauguration, and this is Trump inauguration. Where's the small people? It's pretty clear, it's on the right. Every machine will be able to do this. It's simple, it's explicit information. Actually, every human being would do the same, except perhaps 10 or 12 in Washington. So it's a fairly clear situation here. But then what happens when you have this? So here you have a machine that takes an algorithm, that takes many, many medical dossiers, compiles them, and is capable of detecting sepsis, which is a, you know, a serious condition, 90% of the time better or in actually faster than a doctor. So you have an algorithm that actually performs better than a doctor in the sense that it detects things quicker, right? And then you, doctor, assume you're a doctor, you have to find out what do I do with that? Do I trust it? Do I act upon it? Because I got 16 hours advantage, hmm? but I have to find out if this algorithm is correct. So what is it that made this algorithm go from the evidence it had to the conclusion it makes? So you have to have that clear because otherwise you can't use it. It gets even more complicated in situations like this. So this is an algorithm that predicts road accidents. By the way, this is a simulation. We cannot put out in the real panels on the road because we don't know how people would react to this. But these are algorithms anyway that predict that in the next 10 kilometers, in the next 30 minutes, there's going to be an accident or not, right? And then if they do that, how sure do you need to be before you actually put out that information? Because once the information is out, and maybe this is not the best way to do it, that this is going to change the way people behave. So you might have a change of traffic which removes the incident, but you know, it might actually make it work. So you don't really know. And worse, and even worse, in any case even deeper, is that you have machines that are really so strong and powerful like this one, they can raise a person that cannot do that, but as much as they can raise it, they can also crush it. So you really have to trust them completely. So here's the issue that we try to solve, and I'll give you a couple of examples how we and say, the research community practitioners, those working in AI, try to do it. The main problem you have is you have two types of algorithms. Those that work extremely well, but you don't really know why. Those that you know why they work, but they don't do it that well. Hmm? So explainability and performance are in conflict. There's a trade-off. You want good performance, you don't know how to explain it. You want to explain it, you have to give up performance. We want to get rid of that conflict. We don't want that trade-off. We want to make sure that they're actually explainable and they work well. So some of the things that people are doing is, of course, to test what are the limits of these algorithms. The first thing you want to do, since we are talking about training, and so you're not coding an algorithm, you're training an algorithm, are you introducing biases? Are you introducing biases that make the algorithm work in a way which is not supposed to be? This is called Compass. It's a tool used by courts in the United States, some courts, to decide if a uh, 
convict can be released on parole or not. So you decide in freedom or not for a person. And it does it based on history and a questionnaire and puts out a score. And what comes out is that this algorithm, this has been tested by a number of people that try to push the algorithm to the limit, is that whites who did re-offend, I need to read it because you can't, whites who did re-offend were classified as low risk twice as much as blacks who did re-offend. So that algorithm was really biased in favor of white people, right? Why is that? Is it somebody that did it on purpose? Probably not. There's nobody who wants to do that on purpose. It's just the history, the cases, the judges that decided in the past that had that bias coded in in the information used to train the algorithm, and that's now is part of the code to actually advise judges. So this is one of the main things we cannot afford to do. This has to be sifted out. We can't do this because it's, it's a matter of fact that worse is not a fair place. It's unjust and so on. But there's one thing we cannot afford to take that injustice, code it, and make it part of algorithm. So people are doing something, experiments like this, stretching the algorithms to the limit to find out where they fail or where they break, or in any case, where they are biased. Another case of that exercise is this. So a lot of image recognition, perhaps everything that has to do with image recognition at this point in time is automatic. So you just have software, a tool, an algorithm that does it for you. So if you have a face, you recognize that that face is my face, it's the same with or without. It doesn't matter, it's still me, right? And if I change color of glasses, it's still me. But is it the same for a machine? Actually, it turns out it's not. So some people are using tools and techniques to see where the algorithms break. So you want to stretch it to the limit and find out places and training sets that fool them. This is what these guys have found. It is sufficient, in this case, to wear glasses that have a very specific color and pattern to fool the image recognition algorithm. So what happens is that this guy on the top right, that's the guy, but is recognized as the lady. Hmm? The middle lady is recognized as that guy, and so on. So the, co the algorithm is completely confused. And, and the reason why it does is because that piece of information, that pattern, actually sifts through the neural network, and that some layers of the neural network alters something fundamental there. Remember that we don't really know why this works, so the only thing that we can do is to test it to the limit so we know where it breaks. You will never use something that you don't know where it breaks. So this is fairly important piece of training. But it's all about training, so there is some limit to what you can do by testing. You have to do something up front. This is a typical dilemma of autonomous car. This is a vehicle that cannot stop anymore, and it has three terrible choices hmm, in the next few seconds. Either you hit the person on the right, or you hit the tree on the zebra stripes, or you go against that wall and you risk the life of the passengers of the car. Which one? Hmm? You cannot stop the car. Hmm? This is going to happen. It's actually unfortunate. It has happened to people before. It's, 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 it's one of the situations in which the outcome of your choice is negative. There's nothing positive in that outcome, right? So how do you choose here? Well, if you do training the way we do now with uh, uh, supervised training, you probably do this. So this is the way you train an algorithm to beat a, a, a Go player. This is Go, it's a, it's a board game, it's much more complex than chess. And it was thought that nobody, no algorithm could actually win a human player. But it has been demonstrated last year, it's, it's now it's, it's a done deal. How do you train this? You take many, many games played in the past, you have the algorithm to recognize the patterns of this game, and at the end this algorithm does it as the good players, right? And then actually the trick is we make the algorithm play against itself, so it's going to train even better after a million games. So you can't train a machine, a car, this way, because then you have to create a million deaths hmm, before figuring out that that's not really what you want from the car. So you have to find another way to do it. So the way that I actually is developing now is this. You actually raise algorithms the way, the same way as you raise children, hmm? exactly the same way. With one catch, you cannot wait 20 years. Hmm? So you have to find ways to accelerate that training. So there are a couple of ways that actually work well. One that I like a lot is, is uh, Georgia Tech in the US, is that they create stories about the behavior of people in that situation. Thousands of stories, it's just narratives. And you have algorithms learn from these narratives what are the code, the moral code, or the choices that people have made in those situations. And then that way, you actually have the machine learn what humans have done in a terrible situation like that. It might not be the best choice, but at least is as good as humans have done it. And from there, you can 
construct. So there are a few experiments going on at this moment. One that I like a lot is an algorithm like this, which has been trained to recognize what is the choices, the codes that you use when you go out uh, on a date and you go to the movies. So thousands of people have constructed narratives about that event, and guess what? The algorithm detects a number of things, but what also detects is that a key element in that schema is this. So apparently for that algorithm, kissing is an extremely important element of going out on a day to the movies, hmm? based on the stories of many people. This is a way of learning. And you know what? If an algorithm turns out and suggested kissing, I think we are in, in a good place. Thank you.